Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Hilaphrosaurus, as well as a bunch of dinosaur news. So first in the news is an article published in Nature Commons titled, Bird Embryos Uncover Homology and Evolution of the Dinosaur Ankle. And it was written by Luis Asa Fuentes and some others. And just to interject, this one sent Garrett down a long rabbit hole. It took about half a day, probably. <laughs> Found yeah, out all, all kinds of things. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to share a lot of that rabbit hole but in a very brief summary compared to how much information I shared with Sabrina. Particularly, Sir Richard Owen, which we all know is the guy who coined the term dinosauria and had some other early contributions to dinosaur paleontology, he described many mammalian fossils and was inspired to do so partially by the work of Charles Darwin in South America. He believed in evolution, but he thought that it was more complex than Darwin did, But Darwin may have learned that large rodents evolved to small rodents in South America from conversations between Darwin and Sir Richard Owen. Supposedly, Darwin was on a train of thought where he thought small things evolved into small things and big things evolved into big things. But then Sir Richard Owen gave an example of these really big rodents, like this huge armadillo that was in South America that looked like it had evolved into a small armadillo. So, anyway, that might not even be real because... So Richard Owen apparently had a bad reputation of taking credit for other people's work. Anyway, when Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, there were many who spoke out both for and against the theory, and I think a lot more were against it than for it. But Richard Owen, to some extent, was for it on the basis that he believed evolution, but against some of the details. On the other hand, a man named Thomas Henry Huxley was a big supporter of Darwin's theory, and this is where my rabbit hole started, because he was the original person who compared birds and dinosaurs and believed that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And actually, this theory goes all the way back to an entry in the Annals and Magazine of Natural History way back in 1868. So I just want to talk a little bit about his discussion there because it's fascinating and it's available on the internet archive we'll post a link to it because it's really fun to read the whole text it's only like nine pages on like a you know paperback book size page so it doesn't take long but he discusses his theory of evolution and he says quote it is admitted on all sides that existing animals and plants are marked out by natural intervals into sundry very distinct groups Insects are widely different from fish, fish from reptiles, reptiles from mammals, and so on. And out of this fact arises the very prominent objection, how is it, if all animals have proceeded by gradual modification from a common stock, that these great gaps exist? We who believe in evolution reply that these gaps were once non-existent, that the connecting forms existed in previous epochs of the world's history, but that they have died out. And On that track, later he goes on to speak into a lot of detail about the similarities between birds and dinosaurs, which is really fun to read. Specifically, that even though dinosaurs don't look like birds, when you compare their anatomy, there's a ton of little details in their anatomy that seem to be unique to those two groups, to the point where just by chance them having all these things in common is incredibly unlikely, especially since they're in such different sizes and, you know, fill different niches in the environment. So I didn't see it discussed specifically in the article, but one of the things that he pointed out in the commonality between birds and dinosaurs is that there is a small point in the ankle bone of a dinosaur that sticks up towards the leg from the ankle. So it's basically like if you imagine the ankle bone above the foot on the side that faces the bone, there's just a little bump. And the only place that he saw it was in both birds and dinosaurs. So Asa Fuentes wrote all about this phenomenon, and it's the upward projection specifically is called the ascending process, or ASC. So modern amphibians and some other archosaurs had three bones in their upper ankle, while dinosaurs only had one. 
And because the modern birds had three bones, and since it's the heel bone that has a similar point on it that dinosaurs had, it led to a lot of debate about whether or not this point in the ankle bone was actually an evolutionary link between the two groups. So Jacques Gauthier, a vertebrate paleontologist and professor at Yale University, said, quote, It puts the final nail in the anti-dinosaur coffin. The dinosaurian ascending process is retained in all birds, though it has changed its association from the ankle to heel bones in neonath birds, end quote. And what he's talking about there is the research in this article showed that this point that forms on the top of the ankle bone actually fuses to different parts of the ankle bone in modern birds. So even though there's three bones there, there's actually a fourth bone that forms. It really starts as four bones, and then that previously unknown fourth bone fuses and it ends up looking like a point. And if you're looking at a more modern bird versus a what's considered a more primitive bird, that point fuses onto different points of the ankle. And what they were basically saying is, well, obviously dinosaurs had their ankle bone and had this bone fuse onto it, and birds have the same process happening. The specifics of how the dinosaur ankle bone fused is obviously unknown because we can't study how dinosaur ankles fused, but the fact that this bone fused into different points doesn't seem to be a big distinction anymore. And in an article in the Universidad de Chile, the authors point out, quote, their ankles have somehow resurrected a long-lost developmental pathway still returned in the amphibians of today, a surprising case of evolutionary reversal, end quote. And they're talking about the fact that these old archosaurs had three bones in their ankle, dinosaurs have one bone, and now modern birds have three bones again, which seems pretty weird that they would undo this evolution. But there's also another recent discovery that chameleons also re-evolved this additional unfused ankle bone. And they say, quote, These intriguing discoveries are bound to renew discussion about the interplay between the evolution of new functions and the resurrection of old developmental patterns, end quote. So going way back to Huxley's article, when he talks about birds and dinosaurs being completely different, but having all these same traits that proves that they evolved. He didn't talk about it in that article, but you could imagine him now saying, well, of course, since they're filling different niches, other things would still be changing. And so we see this evolution back towards the original ankle happening as well. Pretty interesting. Definitely check out that original 1868 magazine, which is online. It's pretty cool. In other news, Lisa Granger wrote in The Telegraph about her and her team's experience finding dinosaur prints in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe wasn't really known for dinosaurs until 1984 when an Australian hunter named Mike Aldersey found three-toed footprints of a large creature. A geologist from Zimbabwe's geological survey, Tim Broderick, took a look and found 14 dinosaur prints. They made maps in 1990, and in 2001, he and his wife went back with Theogarten Lingham Solar a South African paleontologist, and as of now, they've documented more than 100 dinosaur footprints in the area. The footprints are in a remote area of Zimbabwe, and they're hard to find. Lisa described the prints as 16 inches long, 12 inches wide, with three toes that were curved with claws. It was probably from a bipedal dinosaur and used its tail to help balance. Lingham Solaire said that it was probably an allosaurus from the late Jurassic, based on the distinctive toes. There's a second set of prints, which shows allosaurus may have hunted in packs. In this set of prints, there are dozens of prints, all different sizes, with some overlapping, which shows that they probably work together, and the smaller prints probably came from babies. Most likely, they were hunting. In the article, Lisa also talks about her team seeing part of a mesospondylus skeleton, which is a prosauropod that lived in the Triassic. The first bones in Zimbabwe were found in 1913, but until 2005, most of the bones were found by locals. Now paleontologists from various museums have collected material from the area to study. The results aren't released yet, though. Lisa and her team also went to Masongo Camp, where a fossil hunter Steve Edwards lives, and he showed the team where he found his dinosaur fossils. He explained the reason that fossils are so well preserved in the area is because silt and sand were dumped on top of them when there were tectonic rift movements. 
However, there are some treasure hunters who have been removing fossils lately from the area, and rain and rivers have swept away some of the fossils or covered some of the prints. In most cases, fortunately, the dinosaur sites are protected and documented, and then the fossils are sent to the Natural History Museum in Bulawayo. An article published in Cretaceous Research titled A Ceratopsian Dinosaur from the Late Cretaceous of Eastern North America and Implications for Dinosaur Biography was just published by Nicholas Longrich. So we've mentioned before that North America used to be separated into several different islands. The two in the modern-day United States are Laramidia and Appalachia, and they were the two biggest ones and the ones where we found the most dinosaurs as well. So there have been previous discoveries of hadrosaurs and tyrannosaurs, and we've seen that they were quite a bit different on those two continents. And since, as Longrich mentions, Appalachia is not known nearly as well as Laramidia, especially in terms of dinosaur <laughs> discoveries, it's nice when we get these discoveries from Appalachia so that we get a better understanding of what was going on on that part of the continent. So there's a really nice drawing in the paper of the area where fossils have been found within Appalachia, and it's kind of a thin wiggle that goes from Kentucky down to Atlanta and then back up to New Jersey. And it also shows which dinosaurs are where, but it's behind a paywall, so I can't share a link to it. What they discovered and what prompted them to write this article was the first Ceratopsian from the late Cretaceous of eastern North America. And eastern North America, he says throughout the article, but to us, that's Appalachia. So specifically, he found the posterior end of a left maxilla, or to put it in normal, non-scientist terms, the back of the left part of the jaw, and it had several teeth in it. He found it in the Campanian Tar Heel Formation, which is in the Black Creek group of North Carolina in the U.S., and the fossils called LPMPU 24964, <laughs> and that means that it's the Yale Peabody Museum Princeton University Collection. It's a catchy name. It really is. And it also kind of shows you that they don't know what dinosaur it is, because otherwise they would just say Stegosaurus, blah, blah, blah. So Longrich believes that it's a leptoceratosid, and it's totally awesome looking. I hadn't seen a leptoceratosid before, but it looks like it has the head of a protoceratops, meaning kind of like a triceratops with a really tiny frill and beak and not really any horns. And its head is really low to the ground because it has much shorter forelimbs than hind limbs. And then it has a relatively long and large tail. So it looks like you smushed a dinosaur like a theropod or something with that big long tail into a ceratopsian. And then took off the horns and just came up with this weird looking thing. So Longrich believes that they may have migrated between Europe, Laramidia, and Appalachia as well as Nunavut and some of the other small islands that are now North America, before they were separated by too much water, and then they diversified afterwards. So according to Longrich, quote, Along with basal tyrannosaurids, hadrosaurines, ornithomimosaurs, and notosaurs, Leptoceratopsidae was part of a distinctive fauna that emerged during the late Cretaceous in eastern North America, end quote. Although less well understood, it appears to be a less diverse group when compared to Europe or Laramidia. So it might be more important to find out about the individual elements since there were less of them there in Appalachia. This species and the other ones in Appalachia appear to be results from dispersal events from both Europe and Laramidia. So it's likely that like I said, this one came from one or the other, or maybe went one way and then evolved a little bit and snuck back and forth. <laughs> and that's how you end up with the interesting diversification. In China, there's a quote-unquote dinosaur king. His name is Xu Xing. He's a paleontologist who's found so many dinosaurs he's lost count. This is according to an article in WDSU. One of his discoveries was of a gigantoraptor, and he's also known for finding evidence of dinosaurs having feathers. And Xu Xing grew up in western China in a remote province of Xinjiang and didn't even hear about dinosaurs until he went to college in Beijing. His assigned major was paleontology. Up until the 1980s, college was free in China and students were assigned majors. 
though now students have to pay tuition and so more students tend to choose business degrees. Peking University, for example, only has maybe one new paleontology student admitted each year. Yet China is having a golden age of dinosaur discovery, and some are saying they're launching a gold rush in fossil excavations. This is mainly due to one fossil site in northern China where dinosaurs died in mass and are well preserved from volcanic eruptions. However, a number of fossils found in China end up in private collections, which has led to some people pasting together fossil parts to make them look more impressive. And this has led to discoveries by Chinese paleontologists who tend to come under harsher scrutiny than discoveries by other paleontologists. Some fossils are so well preserved, though, that they have melanosomes, which paleontologists can study to help determine the color of a dinosaur's feathers. Garrett's covered this in detail in a previous episode, but an example includes Cynosopteryx, which had a ginger and brown striped tail, and Microraptor, which was similar in coloring to a crow. To change gears a bit, NPR's Jason Sheehan gave a glowing review of Simon Stolenhog's art book, Tales from the Loop, and it's a collection of stories and paintings that portray an alternate Sweden in the 80s and 90s that includes abandoned robots and dinosaurs, so of course, I have to include it here. The author started releasing his illustrations on his Facebook page, and they were so popular and fans wanted explanations for the illustrations. So he launched a Kickstarter campaign with a funding goal of $10,000 so he could self-publish an English version of the book. He ended up raising over $320,000. I'm not sure exactly what kind of dinosaurs are in the book, though now I'm very curious and I'm thinking about picking it up, but Jason Sheehan highly recommends it as a Christmas present for the, quote, geek in your family, and he said, quote, they'll love you forever. So if you're looking for a Christmas present, maybe pick up Tales from the Loop. In Auckland, New Zealand, visitors to Kelly Tarleton's Sea Life Aquarium can now see digital displays of prehistoric sea creatures. Visitors can interact with Plesiosaurus, Lepleurodon, and Megalodon, as well as crabs and sharks that lived in the Jurassic era in the Jurassic Seas exhibit. So if you're there and you happen to visit, please let us know how it looks. In San Antonio, Texas, the Witt Museum has a new mascot, a T-Rex called Tex-Rex. Pretty clever. Uh, Susan Malton, a supporter of the museum, donated $4 million to the museum so that visitors can learn about dinosaurs that lived in what is now San Antonio. The dinosaurs will be in the Naylor Family Dinosaur Gallery, which is set to open in spring 2017, and visitors will be able to go on real and virtual excavations as well as interact with five life-size dinosaurs. And lastly, this is one of my favorite news stories. This was in the Atlas Obscura, and they have a lot of interesting and really will detail dinosaur stories. There's a couple named Greg and Meredith Talley, and they own a Best Western Hotel in Lakewood, Colorado, and they worked with the Morrison Natural History Museum, as well as the paleontologist Robert Bacher, to renovate their hotel to be a historically accurate dinosaur hotel. They wanted it to be tasteful, not too kitschy, so that business people could still feel comfortable having meetings with clients in the hotel. And in 2012, they spent $5 million on the remodel, which reopened in April 2013. So yes, we're a little bit late, but we did hear about it through the Atlas Obscura article, which was published very recently this month. So examples of what you can see at this dinosaur hotel is the checking counter has imprints of Nautilus fossils. There are skulls of Eddie the Edmontosaurus, Jim Bob the Allosaurus, and Butthead the Pachycephalosaurus, as well as Stanley the Stegosaurus who sits out front. You can also see Sophie, a Tylosaurus skeleton that kind of swims on the roof of the breakfast room. And the next step in their plan is to put a mosaic mural of the Cretaceous Seaway at the bottom of their swimming pool. So next time we're in Colorado, Garrett, I know where we'll be staying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for the news. Now on to the dinosaur of the day, Elaphrosaurus, whose name means lightweight lizard, and it was a slender dinosaur. It's a ceratosaur theropod, also in the Avrostro group, and it lived in the Jurassic in what is now Tanzania, Africa. It was described and named by Werner Janisch in 1920, and the type species is Elaphrosaurus bambergii. It's mostly known from one nearly complete skeleton, but doesn't have a skull. And the type specimen was found in 1910, again by Werner Janinch, as well as I. Salem, H. Breck, and Parkinson, and it's now in the Humboldt Museum in Berlin, Germany. It was first classified as a sea lurid, which was a wastebasket taxon for small theropods at the time. It was put in the Ornithomimidae family in 1928, 
by Nopska due to its light frame. Its limbs look similar to Coelophysis, and in 1990, Barsbold, Marianska, and Osmolska classified it as an ornithomimid. Carano and Sampson in 2008 and Carano and All in 2012, in a study, assigned it to the genus Ceratosauria, and Limusaurus is now considered to be Elaphrosaurus's closest relative. Some fossils have been found over the years that were thought to be Elaphrosaurus, but are now considered dubious. This includes Elaphrosaurus iguidensis, which was described in 1960, with fossils collected in Algeria, Libya, and Niger. That included more than 40 teeth, caudal vertebrae, and a complete tibia, but they came from three different localities and are not the same species. There's also Elaphrosaurus gatiri, described in 1960 as well. That was found in Niger and consisted of a complete neck vertebrae, but it's now been renamed Spinostophius gotteri in 2004, was renamed. There's also a Laphrosaurus philtipitensis, which was named in 1995 after Phil Tippett, the visual effects supervisor who worked on Jurassic Park. This is based on tibia, humerus, and some metatarsals. But in 2005, paleontologists said that they were probably not ceratosaurid and were more likely a coelurid theropod, Tanicolagrius. Then there was also Elaphrosaurus agilis, described in 1972 by Dale Russell, based on pubic bones that Charles Marsh had named Coelurus agilis, which he thought was a larger version of the type species Coelurus fragilis. But in 1980, John Ostrom confirmed Charles Gilmore's notion that Coelurus agilis was synonymous with Coelurus fragilis, so Elaphrosaurus agilis is the same as Coelurus fragilis. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Elaphrosaurus was medium-sized, up to 20 feet or 6.2 meters long, and bipedal. It's about 5 feet or 1.5 meters at the hip and weighed about 460 pounds or 210 kilograms. It had a long, thin neck and a stiff tail, but it had a shallow chest compared to other theropods that were similar in size. It had short hind limbs, but its tibia or shin bone was longer than its femur or thigh bone, so it was probably a fast runner. It had three-toed feet and short, thin arms with three fingers on its hands. Dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place as Elaphrosaurus included the sauropods, Giraffatitan, as well as theropods, a stegosaurus such as Kentrosaurus, Iguanodontians like Decelotosaurus. Other animals included pterosaurs and early mammals. Elaphrosaurus was too small to hunt sauropods and stegosaurs, so it probably went after smaller herbivores. In addition to Africa, Elaphrosaurus may have also been found in the Morrison Formation in the U.S., but small theropod fossils in the Morrison Formation are relatively rare in terms of we haven't found too many yet. In 2001, paleontologist Trier referred to the right tibia of a small theropod in Garden Park, Colorado as Elaphrosaurus, but there's been debate. In 2008, two paleontologists suggested that it was closer to Tendaguru than Elaphrosaurus. Elaphrosaurus and other dinosaurs found in the Tendaguru were mounted in the museum in Berlin after World War I, even with the economic slump and riots and strikes. Elaphrosaurus was the second dinosaur mounted there. It was mounted in 1926, and the first dinosaur was Kentrosaurus, mounted in 1924, and the third was Dicreosaurus, which was mounted in 1930 and 1931. Elaphrosaurus is, again, in the Averostra group. And Averostra's name means bird snouts. It's a clad that includes most theropods that have a promaxillary fenestra, which is an additional opening in the front of the maxilla. Gregory S. Paul named Averostra in 2002, though Martin Excura and Giles Curry redefined it in 2007. Elaphrosaurus is also a ceratosaur, and ceratosaurs are theropods with more in common with ceratosaurus than with birds, though there's no agreed upon listing of characteristics. The latest theory, though, is that it includes theropods from the late Jurassic to the late Cretaceous. And our fun fact of the day comes from that crazy rabbit hole I went down about Richard Owen and the original bird versus dinosaur description. And it's about Richard Owen, who again is the guy who named Dinosauria. He spent a lot of time researching living mammals as well as all these dinosaurs and extinct species. And in 1834, the London Zoological Society purchased a male Indian rhinoceros at his request. And then 15 years later, when it died, he apparently brought it home to dissect it, and that's where his wife discovered it when she entered the front hall of her house. <laughs> Can't even imagine. <laughs> so it seems crazy that he would put a rhinoceros in his house. Must be a big house. Yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> Seems like he'd have a lab for that. Maybe it was on its way to a lab. I don't know. 
It's crazy. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you would like to support us feeling generous this holiday season, then please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.